Hello, welcome back to Beyond the Streets, another episode. Uh, today, I have a good friend of mine, someone that I've been working with for years, which is Russell Neverdon, who is an attorney here in Baltimore and also a big community activist and also um, a, a proud supporter of the Guardian Angels, of course. And, and uh, I, I always like talking to Russell because I think you're going to get a different perspective of Baltimore, politics, youth, community activism, and uh, not from one man's point of view, but from a, one man's point of view who wears a lot of hats. So help me welcome uh, Russell Neverdon. Thank you, thank you. Good to be here. It's good to have you. It's been a, it's been a long time. So this is kind of uh, kind of long overdue, but it's good to have you here. Thank you, thank you. So you and I used to talk a lot about community activism and all the stuff that we got going on. And you know, I've been kind of wanting to catch up with you to find out, okay, Let's just talk about Baltimore. Okay. What's happening to Baltimore? And we've, we've got so many moving parts. Well, we do. Um, and I think that's probably the best segue because while we do have a lot of moving parts, the problem is they're not moving in synchronicity. Um, we've got a police department that is depleted of resources and, and basically the manpower. We have a state's attorney's office. Uh, that is uh, having apparently grave difficulty with repairing that relationship that used to be in place because uh, they have to work hand in hand. They're two separate entities, but they do have to work hand in hand uh, from an investigative standpoint if we're really going to get the repeat violent offenders off the street. Um, we've got a, unfortunately, what appears to be or has been, his, uh, was now, I guess, being revealed is a failed or defunct uh, leadership with City Hall where, you know, we've just got all sorts of things just going awry, and I think the public is, is fed up. Not that any of these things haven't been going on for quite some time, but, you know, in an age of technology, social media, uh, the camera phone, things are just being caught and being exposed, so a lot more people now becoming uh, aware of these things that are happening. But we still have a great deal of work to do um, as far as... Um, not just cleaning up City Hall, but we've got to clean up our police department, we've got to clean up our communities, and we've got to clean up our families. We, too, have to take responsibility for the role that we play and contribute to this stuff. So we've got, there's just a lot going on in Baltimore. Um, I refuse to give up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised here in Baltimore. Uh, I've, I've lived in the county. I've had that county life. I've lived outside the, the jurisdiction. But I do believe that um, Baltimore still is, is a very rich uh, jewel that if we polish her up and, and we take care of it the way we're supposed to, uh, we can get back to what it used to be, uh, which is a great community. Um, but we've we've got a lot of work to do. Now I know <clears throat> with the elections coming up, yeah, and we have everybody and their brother running for something. It's just a lot. Yeah, and I'm not saying we have a lot of qualified people, but we have a lot of people who figure I can do better. Right. Okay. And with that, you know, this is this is different than than any election time in Baltimore. Now, I bring it up before when we talk about uh, uh, when Mayor Blake ran, we had over 22 people running for mayor. Right. And now I think we have at least 16 or so. Right. So we're doing okay. a repeat. So we're doing a repeat here. What do we, I mean, how realistic is that we're going to have a change? that we're going to have something come out and we're going to have something that stands out and says, okay, we finally have hope here. Do you see any? Well, I'm going to tell you, you, you know, when you look at the candidates that are in the race, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't uh, push anybody on anyone uh, because I think that we have to, whenever we affiliate ourselves, there has to be some commonality, which is why we draw to a, a given individual. And in this case, what we have are, we've got a lot of candidates uh, and, and it really what it comes across as <clears throat> for those who are in the in the in the, the the primary focus, if you will, everybody's fighting over sound bites, but nobody's really fighting for the true interests of the people. That's the problem that I'm having. Um, you know, it, it sounds good. Uh, you know, we know what the issues are. We know we got a crime problem. Um, but the problem is, is it's not that we know that we have a crime problem. That's the manifestation, if you will, that's the symptoms of what's really wrong with this city. We've got broken people, we've got broken systems, and we've got some broken infrastructure that has to be healed. If you get a better school system, you've got people working, you've got better housing, 
you're going to have a better community. You're going to have a better person. When you have people who are uh, a lack of education, you have people who don't have job skills, when you, have, you don't have jobs that are actually available, you're basically reducing people down to their very basic animal instinct, which is, I'm going to survive by any means necessary. So if the average person is dealing with a situation where you expect me to go to McDonald's and work for two weeks, and by the time they take taxes and all these other things, and FICA and this one and that one and the other, and by the time I go through all of that, I'm looking at maybe about two or $300 because I'm at that minimum wage uh, level. I can't survive on that. You know, and so at the end of the day, when you're looking at those kinds of things, if it means I can take that Louis Vuitton purse from that woman, which I can get a, at least a few hundred dollars, and then whatever the content may be inside, I've got to weigh the pros and the cons. Is it worth the risk? And in, in a lot of these instances, when you don't have other options or, or choices, that is worth the risk. And so, so now you have people who are preying on others because... It's almost the, you know, dog eat dog. It's just we're getting to that point or we've been to that point where that's what's happening. And so we've got a we've got a, a criminal justice system from the corrections aspect of it that I think we've done a, a piss poor job of not really reinvesting in that. Because if you don't set people up to be successful, they're going to come out and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a cycle. And unfortunately, if we're being honest with ourselves, crime pays doesn't pay the, the criminal, but it does pay those who are invested in it. Security companies make more money. We're buying more ring video uh, cameras. We're buying more ADT alarm systems. We're buying all sorts of things. We're changing locks. We're buying electronic this. We're even buying systems that allow us to look at it from home. Mm -hmm. So the consumer is now buying more equipment. Then you've got more overtime by, with law enforcement. You've got more private security companies. So it's business, let's be clear. And then the, the criminal... and. Uh, the uh, prison system in and of itself is now getting to the point where it's become privatized in a lot of jurisdictions, and, and it's almost, it's a stock. And so, now, and, he, and here's the part that really gets me. If you look at a lot of the furnitures that's throughout the state and things of that nature, it's made by inmates. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's be clear. You've got a, a surplus of cheap labor that, that's right there, and... So it benefits them. Yeah, you look. What's, what's that movie was? Uh, Brew Baker. <laughs> oh right, right. <laughs> you know, Brew Baker. But you you talked about. We talked about the mayor. We talked about the crime. We talked about it pays. But on the mayor's race, what's funny to me is that it looks like the candidates, either by media or by competition, are running on sound bites that are basically mistakes or mishaps or bad things, as opposed to what's positive about each candidate. Do you see that? Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because my thing is, is you can't scare me into voting for you. I know that it's, it's bad out here in Baltimore. I know that the crime is, is at an all-time high. There's a distrust with the community and the police department. There's a strain in the state's attorney's office. But you can't scare me into keep talking about this repeat violent offender. No, how about you talk to me about, as you said, talk, give me some positive points about What's good about Baltimore and how you're going to build from there and take that to the next level? Talk to me about how you're going to take our actual resources, which is our Department of Housing, uh, the, the Mayor's Office of Economic Employment Development, uh, you know, our, our local agencies, how you're going to make them better and ensure with greater oversight that the resources that our tax dollars pay for are actually being utilized to the maximum so that we're getting people back to work, we're creating jobs, you know, the stuff is just right there. And I just want to, I, I, I'm tired of hearing about this reactionary thing. Nobody's talking proactive. How do we proactively <clears throat> prevent some of these things? You know, if you're saying we're at a war to, we're at a war right now on saving Baltimore, right? And so from my military experience, when we go into war or into battle, we understand that there are some casualties. There are projected casualties. The goal is to minimize the amount of casualties in order to achieve the mission. Some people, no matter how much resources you put into them, it's just not going to make a difference. But you still have to make that effort. But it's for the greater good, so we have to keep pushing. And that's what I really want to hear a candidate talk about. Talk about the positive things. Talk about a proactive, preventative standpoint on how you're going to pull all these resources together. Because truth be told, 
if all these other uh, agencies are failing, crime is bound to happen. Um, and so that's really what I want, where, where I really want to be. I'm tired of the finger pointing. It's a turn off. You know, you, you want to take a jab at me. This one's got a brother that's a drug dealer. Oh, you, you, you gave a false address. Oh, you didn't do that. Oh, you were convicted before. Oh, you did this. So you, look, at the end of the day, and, and, and really the onus falls on us as, as the citizens, we have to stop looking at leadership as being our salvation. They are our representatives. That's it. And so we have to go to City Hall when they're having the Board of Estimate meetings. We have to be there when they're talking about proposing new laws or referendums uh, and things that are going before the body. We have to make sure that we are aware of what's happening on that ballot before it's even cast and actually read the ballot to understand exactly what we're about to vote on because we don't. And so it's easy to put something in writing and slide it through when we say, oh, it's, it's so much language, it's so verbose, they're not even going to really read it, and they don't. You know, you're talking about, you know, and I'm just being facetious, but, you know, I remember something dealing with there was a, a budget or funding they were talking about for doing some library uh, rehab stuff, but it was a discretionary clause in there that said, oh, but if we decide that we can do other things with it and it benefits, <laughs> you know, then that's what we'll do. And people just checking off the box. But And, and that makes it easy to check off it, the box. Exactly. That gives you a reason. So, oh, we got we got this. Now, we talked about, like you said, what the, the, crime does, the crime does pay. And you're right, for the criminals, crime does pay. But also they have that benefit that realistically... How many crimes are being solved and how many people are being caught in Baltimore? It's not a lot. Well, and now based on, like I said, you were military police as well. Yeah. Okay, so what is it that, that the police, that you see? I mean, obviously, I ask everybody, what do you think the police need to do? And everybody's got their own opinion. But what do you do in a department like Baltimore that used to have, what, 3,000 police officers? And right. now they're, they're down, what, maybe another, what, eight or eight to 1,000 police officers? They can't get people to join. Right. What's the answer? What do you do? So what you uh, well, one, you have to incentivize. You have to create um, a a lure, if you will, that that makes people feel like I can come in here. One, I think most people go in with with the grand notion of I'm going to make a difference. And so you have to start with that basic principle that most people who are joining the police department believe that they can make a difference. Um, so that's the first thing. Then you have to not only incentivize, but you have to reward them and you have to stand loyal to them. We've got some there and, you know, just over the time when I've dealt with boards, representing officers on boards, and I've had to sue the Baltimore City Police Department. There's some common things that are there. The administration and the leadership, there's there's fracturing that's going on. You still got clicks and things of that nature that are going on. Mm -hmm. And you've got to reward those who are doing a good job. And, 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 and from a leadership standpoint, the actual leader is only as good as the people that they surround themselves with. And so we've got to get away from this, 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 this horrific reputation that we have, which is, you know, you've got citizens who are disrespecting the, the cops. Well, let's look at when that kind of happened, <clears throat> because when I was coming up, there was, there was a time where if an officer, when they actually walked the beat, and I'm not talking about just walked mm -hmm. and with, with blinders on, but I'm talking about actually engaged, communicating with where people they knew that who were you out were, there. They knew, they knew, they knew who where you to find were. You. If they, that officer came and he saw us as young kids we were standing around, he said, look, when I come back, I don't want to see you here. We knew what that meant. We better be gone. That's right. Uh, even when you saw some of the older kids who were into, you know, I guess the little pot or hanging out on the corner doing whatever they were doing, when that officer came in there, he usually took it, balled it up, mushed it with his foot and said, hey, we're done. We're done. They walked off. There was that level of respect. And you had that relationship, that, that somewhat of a relationship. You knew who he was. And, and you know, granted, when, like in Baltimore County, they had that when I was little. But at the same time, same thing. They, if somebody mentioned your name, they knew where you'd be. Oh, I know where he's at. He's over at the field playing baseball right now. And he's probably riding his bike through here. They knew where to find you because they took the time to build that relationship. And, and we, we don't have that anymore. And we also have to be very, very uh, mindful, which is what, what uh, I think is also a missing piece is, uh, and people always say, well, you know, well, why do you think that things are the way that they are in Baltimore? I said, because we have hoods. We don't have neighborhoods anymore. I said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, because if you take the neighbors out of a neighborhood, all you have left is a hood. That's right. Right? That's so right. You have blight, you have devastation, you have underinvestment, and you have people who are under, um, who are under concern, if you will, 
about the community. They just want to be left alone. I just want to get through. I don't want to be bothered. I'm in my own silo. That's really where I want to be. And so we've got to come up with ways to bring people in. What, what, and, and when you think about it as, as a family man, as a husband, as a father, when we go into communities and we're talking about raising our family, we want good schools, we want accessibility, and we want quality goods and services that, we, that are amenable, uh, amenable to us within you know, close proximity. I don't want uh, some no-name market that has goods that I can't even read what's on the, on the back of it as a market. I don't want that. Hey, I don't want a school that's not that. performing uh, or is underperforming the way it's supposed to be. I don't want a, a neighborhood that's riddled with crime. So when you fix those things, then you're going to have people who want to come in. The more people that come into a community, the greater it expands, the more of a neighborhood that it becomes, the more home ownership that you have, the more people are paying taxes, the more services that we're able to get, the less welcome that the drug dealer or the, the, the criminal element feels comfortable with because all eyes are on me. The whole goal of in, 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 in criminal enterprise is to move in stealth outside the purview of everybody else. And so, so you have that piece, and then you also have... If you're not scared of the police, you shouldn't be scared of the police, but you should respect the police. And so we've got to rebuild that respect. We've got to rebuild. And I think the best way that you can do that. And that's you, nationwide. That's nationwide. And the best way that you can do that is you get the local people. you got to stop having these outliers coming from out of, out of jurisdiction, coming into this community, don't know the people, don't know the problems, and they're then trying to come in and police because you bring your biases and your life experiences with you. I know based on, from my experience as, as, a, as a criminal defense attorney. You think I can't spot a, a client not being honest with me? Well, I gotta give them that look like, okay, so when you're ready to have a real conversation so we can figure out how to help you, come back and let's talk then. Let's talk about that. Right. Let's, talk about, <laughs> let's talk about this right now. <clears throat> you are a criminal defense attorney. I am. In Baltimore. In Baltimore. Now, it's funny because as, as we all go through our everyday lives and all this and we see a lot of stuff that happens the last thing we do is we think about uh what happens when these guys when something happens with the law and you get an attorney <clears throat> excuse me like russell never done and i remember i called you a while ago and i said man we need to talk about some of the stories you hear but at the same time I wanted to know what is it you see and what do you feel when, when, when these things come to you? Because, you know, a lot of times I'll call you, I'll call you for advice or questions and I'll say, right. hey, Russell, and believe it or not, people, he answers the damn phone, he gets right back to me. But the thing is, there's a lot of stuff that I don't understand and what gets me the most is the, some of the people that come to look for lawyers, some of their family members who have to hire you or have to come to you and say, hey, Ray Ray got into some kind of trouble. What's going on? And a lot of times these people are guilty. And a lot of times, you know, and, and sometimes they're not. But what do you see? What is that like for you? Because it's just a, it's a different feel. You know, it's, 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 and you and I talked about it. So the, 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 what, I've, what I've gotten to uh, in, in the practice is, and bear in mind, um, so you, I'm coming from as a military police officer, so I have a law enforcement background. Then from there, um, um, you're talking about having worked uh, for, in human services, juvenile corrections, um, dealing with and mental health with adults. So that whole breadth of experience just all kind of led to in dealing with the law and then also uh, interning and clerking at the state's attorney's office. So you haven't seen, there's not much you haven't seen. Exactly. So, so when, you, you, when you're talking about getting to the point of somebody coming in and saying, I need representation. So, at the, so and one thing that I've taken pride in in 21 years of practicing law, one, I always let my clients know, I'm not here to judge you. Everyone is entitled to representation. Um, the, the Constitution guarantees it. And the courts must uphold that. And so, therefore, you have one of two choices. I can sit down. I can talk with them. We can talk about the facts. We can talk about the evidence that's in place. And then I can say, my advice to you legally would be, here are your options. Here's the greater likelihood of success. And here's the greater likelihood of failure if you decide to go to trial. So then you have to make a decision. Is it better for me to go to trial? Or is it better for me to seek mitigation which is facts that would give a court greater consideration in me not spending the rest of my life behind bars or not spending a substantial amount of time behind bars, which is what you and I had talked to 
off camera we were talking about, it, when we walk into that courtroom that day, it's not about what my performance will be or what that jury decides. It's what do you do when you take control of your life moving forward from that day on? Do I want to find myself in the same situation or if I make a decision to do a plea and how do I process to have something in place once I get out of prison and turn my life around and do things differently? And so that's where that comes into. But for me, it's not a judgment call. The, the, the state or the government, if it's at the federal level, must prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's that's the key. Unfortunately, in some of these cases, I've had a lot of cases where people wanted to plead guilty, just wanted to get a good deal, reasonable. And that's me taking basically the totality of circumstances, what their criminal history may have been and what the guidelines call for. And then I've got, gotten an overzealous prosecutor who says, OK, your guidelines call for five to seven years, but they want 15 years. You've left me no choice but to go to trial. Hmm. Right. Now, if it's a close call and someone who's worth their salt, they're going to take you to the mat and they're going to make you prove your case. And a lot of these these uh, prosecutors or uh, who are used to pushing, pushing, pushing deals. Now, all of a sudden they're back into a corner and they got to try this case and they're not winning. Hmm. So, you know, I've, I've had some experiences where I've had repeat violent offenders who were saying, I'm going to sit down. I got to get myself together. But you backed them into a wall where we had to try a case and I win. So now you're out. Now they have a, a false sense of empowerment, if you will, a false sense of security. So I, hey, if I get in a little bit of trouble, I'll go back to a Neverdon or a Tony Garcia or an Ivan Bates or J. Wendell Gordon or Warren Brown or Ken Ravenel. You know, I can try my hand, you know, uh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, Mr. Mr. Roland Brown just beat my case, so you know I had a handgun on me, but eh, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I might I might do it a little different this time, so so that way I'm going to I'm gonna try something else. Or um, I was caught with some drugs, but Rodney Gray is you know he he he's a good lawyer. He he beat that case. Or uh, I was charged with a you know armed robbery or carjacking, and 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 Landon White did something different, and and, I'm and good. he beat the case. I'm good. So. So we have to be mindful that, unfortunately, it's almost a badge of honor to, to some of these guys that once they beat that case, they just feel like, I'm, I'm invincible, you know? Particularly if you have a, a, a series of charges that are happening and you keep winning those cases. So that means, which is why it's important that the Baltimore City Police and the state's attorney's office works closer hand in hand because... There should be an investigative piece. We have to be stop rushing for numbers and really look for the, I'd rather the quality of a prosecution than the quantity of a prosecution. Now, we talked before. One of the things that stayed with me that, that when we talked about this probably a year ago mm -hmm. was that you were one of the, full, one of the few people, and, and I, I, I always respect you, but this was awesome to me, where you told me where you could literally sit and talk to a family member who was about to put their house up or go broke and, you know, basically risk everything for a loved one that they had who basically was probably going to come back in another four to five months and do the same thing someplace else. But that's okay for the, like you said, because now that I got this badge of honor, I'm getting off, but forget the grandma put her house up and forget the grandma owes this, this lawyer and all this money now because I've been out for four months and I know I'm going to go back and do the same thing. And you were one of the people, one of the only people that I've heard say to me, you talk to the family member and say, okay, here, you're about to risk everything you own Absolutely. for somebody who may be coming right back here in another month. Yep. When did you reach that point? I mean, that's a hard thing for a, 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 a defense attorney to say because it's like money in the bank. Well, you, because at some point there has to be, I think we have a, a I have a cultural and an, uh, and an ethnic, and not ethic, but ethnic responsibility to my community as an African American. Because what I see, the pattern or the, or the, the routine is, I see mothers, I see grandmothers, I see children's mothers, I see the girlfriends or the significant others. They're the ones who are, bur who are bearing the burden financially. If you're a drug dealer, why don't you have money put up? 
<laughs> but she's taken her mortgage, she's taken her rent, she's taken all sorts of other resources to pull it to pay me. So then there has to be a point that I have to say, wait a minute. It's not about the money. It has to be about the service that I'm providing. And the service goes beyond because when that person goes to jail, that family goes to jail with them. Mm -hmm. And people don't, don't realize that. And so when you're talking about when you're going to court, they're going to court with you. That's right. And so for me, if you can't be honest with me, if you are not straightforward, if the facts are just so egregious and I'm telling you I don't believe a word you're saying and you still want to play that game... I will tell that family, I'm not accepting another dime. What I have not billed, I'm giving you back. You need to go to the office of the public defender and save your money. Period. Because I didn't get into this to be rich. I got into this to make a difference, to make an impact. And so at this point, uh, I'm seeing a shift. And as I always tell people, before that was an adult who committed a crime, they were once a child. So now I'm trying to focus on how do we get to that place of innocence before it was lost, and and which is which is why I want to put a school together. Tune in next time to see the second half of this interview. Join the following program already in progress. We talked about the families. We talked about all that. You have so much going on with you. Where, granted, you're a successful attorney. You can do whatever you want. I, I was going to ask you, why didn't you run for mayor? But I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. But I don't know. We might, come, we might come back to that, people. We may, talk, we may come back to that. But you have a lot going on for you. And you think long term. Let's talk about this school. Let's okay. talk about the school. Boys Rock. Okay, he's got a program on that. But we're going to go beyond the Boys Rock. We're going to come back to it. But let's talk about the fact that here's a guy who wants to put together a school to cover everything that's needed to be done and put all the pieces in place that you say are missing. Yeah. So, so what I started seeing over the years were uh, consistent patterns, if you will. Um, I started seeing uh, lead paint exposure, developmental disabilities, kids who just were not thriving in school. I started seeing a lot of the same patterns of dysfunctionalism, uh, missing parents in the house, or parents who were physically there but not mentally there. Uh, those who were struggling with addiction themselves, kids taking care of themselves, uh, and young children being forced to grow up much faster than they should. And then I started to see the correlation between young adults and even older adults who just are violent, who are bitter, who are angry, and who uh, are just frustrated. And I realized that we're not really fighting crime, we're fighting hopelessness and brokenness. There's something broken inside these people. and. Before they became this adult, at one point they were a child, a child who had innocence, a child who expected the world and other adults around them to provide and take care of them. And then we were expecting them to also to thrive in an academic environment in school where we seen that that's failed. And so to me, I looked at, well, what's the best way from a preventative standpoint, and it's going to be long term, that we have productive young men and women who are really in a position to do things differently. And, and help our communities grow, that they become the next families. Um, because see, when I was coming up, your family meant everything. If a kid went outside the house uh, in the wintertime and didn't have a coat on, it's not because he was cold. It's because you represented your family. <laughs> and your mother or your grandmother, whoever that matriarch was that was dealing with that, it was an embarrassment for her for you to be improperly dressed. And so... Those are the things, you know, you knew the Smiths or the Robinsons or the Johnsons or the Greens. You always knew who those families were. And people took pride in that family uh, relationship and that bond. You know, now I've seen kids curse mom out, curse dad out. There's a lack of respect. They're getting high with them. It's just outrageous. And so. And it's generational. And it's generational. And that's the problem. And so for me, we have to do better. And I think the way that we do better is we give them options and the way that kids get option is we have to recognize that every child is capable of learning right whether they special ed or they have some learning difficulties whatever but every child is capable of learning so that's the first premise number two every child is not college bound somebody's got to build the building somebody's got to build the infrastructure somebody's got to be the, the banker or the security guard or whatever everybody has a, a purpose and a, and a function in which you will contribute and to society. And that's where skills come in. And that's where the skills come in. Right now, our kids are being educated to take tests. I'm so sick of hearing about 
measurements <clears throat> and tests and things of that nature, where the and skills and building blocks for these kids to be able to, when you walk out that door in high school, if you never hit a doorstep on anybody's college, you should be able to go out here and get a job. And the funny thing is, like you said, out, you know, kids go to school to learn to pass the test. So basically, you're going to school to learn to pass, to answer questions that right. we've given you. Yep. Okay, now throw a question on there that we didn't give you. Right. Can you figure that one out? Right. Because and that's, we don't that's have a scary thing. And that's the same thing that happened with me with law school. You know, I, I, I was a smart kid. I, I could always memorize things. I had a great, I still do have the great ability to just recall detail to things that are there and, and memory. And the hardest transition was, okay, so here's this, here's that, here's the other. Now we're going to take one of these things away. Now what do you have? And I'm like, uh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, okay, this, wait a minute, this is a little different. Because I was so used to saying you had A, B, and C. Okay, there's A, B, and C. There's B, A, and C. C, A, and B. I can give it to you any way that you want. <laughs> but when you took one of those things out, it was like, whoa, I got to think about this a little differently now. And so we've got to get back to that part of getting our kids to become critical thinkers, not just memorize and regurgitate this information, but how to critically use it and apply it to what they need in order to be successful. And how to learn. The, the, I mean, one of the things that my mother was always uh, focused on when we were kids and my, and my, my sister Regina was how to learn. Right. This, you need to learn how to learn. So that way when you have a question, okay, how do I figure this out myself? Where do I get these answers from? And, and a lot of times we just don't see that anymore because we, we just don't. We don't see it anymore. So this school mm -hmm. that I think is a great idea, we've talked about it before. How soon? When? What do we, what's, what's it take? Because this is, this is a big deal. This so, is a very big deal. It's, it's huge. So one of the things that, uh, so what I've been doing is, is I've, been, I've, been, I've been networking my butt off. I've been, I've been meeting with the elected. I've been, you know, I, and I, I just I finished the first cohort for planning in Baltimore City. Uh, so I got an idea of how that whole infrastructure works from acquiring a building and, and the zoning and, and from the academics and going down to City Hall and, and listening in on those, going to the Board of Education, just getting myself really up to speed, working with grant writers, going in there, looking at those who can develop curriculums and then just taking some of the basic things that that I understood and understand about uh, kids and particularly working with kids coming from devastating communities and devastated fun and dysfunctional environments at the house and saying how do we better educate these kids and one of the things I realized was is that schools are now being used as daycares right yeah so you know where they are from this time to this time and it's okay and that's okay right but so for me, because so not only do I do criminal defense work but you know I do plaintiff work I do civil work I do family law but I've, I've dealt with situations where I've represented fathers who only want to have a relationship with their child, but the mother will withhold the child because she's more concerned with who's that girlfriend for the weekend that my child's going to be exposed to, but will not take herself to that school Monday through Friday to find out who the teachers are that are dealing with and responsible for their child. It, it, it's just mind blowing. So the school is, is based on is basically going back to basics, going back old school. It's a community based concept. Uh, one of the things that, or part of the core curriculum will be every child will learn how to play chess. Critical thinking, long-term thinking. Not checkers, not what's immediate, but long-term. Learning how to strategize and think down the road. Every child will participate in debate. Learning how to orate or to orally have your disagreement and understand effectively and appreciate what another person is saying and being able to take it, process it, and then give them something different. Kids get frustrated, and if I can't effectively communicate, the first thing I want to do is I want to put the I'm hands up. I want to reach up. out. I want to reach out. But so we want to give them those oral skills. The other thing is we want to make sure that we are trade-oriented all the way through whatever is the, the technology. So I want STEM as my primary base because that's the direction that we're going in. Um, we need to take something from our Asian community and understand how they are gearing them up as early as possible. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear that, everybody? So, so we want to do that. And then I also want to have a bridge. I want to go back to the old school values of having children respect adults, and then we have a greater respect for our seniors. Those senior citizen homes, they're going to be a part of our teaching staff. They're <coughs> going to come in and they're going to help give these kids some of that basic uh, relationship. You know, because for me, I remember as a kid how excited I was to be up underneath my grandfather and listen to the old men tell their stories because that was a part of the education you just couldn't get inside and those four walls. We talked about this a while. We I talked actually, about that. I did right. a post on it, and 
the it's 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 crazy because I'm telling you people once these seniors are gone unless you took the time to talk to them about the history of your family or your roots or the community or whatever they're past that's gone they're all lessons for the future Absolutely. and once it's gone it's gone so you need to go sit down and talk to grandma or grandpa or whoever it is in your neighborhood but because that that's an important piece of of growing it, that I think that we're that we're missing and now we have grandmothers who are less than 20 years old it's, to 30 it's, years old. It's, it's my you know. So, and then the other part of it is, is allowing children to be children. Elementary will be separated from middle school. Middle school will be separated from high school. Let them grow and mature as they are supposed to. You, mixing them together, they're exposed to too much. They got enough that they're dealing with at home. And on social and, media and on, and on social television. Media, absolutely. So, so it's, 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 you know, and the cost of tuition, parents must actively be members of our parent teacher association and must donate 100 hours of community service every year 100 hours a year okay that's less than two that's, that's a little bit more than two 40 hour work weeks listen to what he said what, what, what do you got to do what's the tuition for it 100 hours of community service per parent and they must be active members meaning serve on a board or on a committee of our parent teacher association you have to be an active member in that school with your child. So what is your biggest hurdle in getting this thing going and how can people help you? So right now I, I, have, I have grant writers, as, as, the, as the young kids say, I got grant writers on deck, I have curriculum writers on deck, um, I have, uh, I've got a lot of support from other folk, I've just got to find a building and then I've just got to put my application together and go before uh, you know, the Board of Education and say, hey, I'm making an application, I want my charter, Here's where we are, have everything set up, have my budget lined up. All those, the, the, the more uh, critical things, that's the easy part. Getting that building and getting it approved because another thing is, even if you could find a building, you're also still talking about we got to make sure that we've got environmental factors. I don't want to pull you out of one negative environmental factor which you're dealing with another one and put you in another one. Got to make sure it's lead, lead free. Yep. I want to make sure that uh, you know, we, we have a green uh, a school that, when we're talking about STEM, I also want the parents to participate in that community to help participate in renovating it and making it because I want you to take pride in saying that's mine not that's just not where my kid goes to school but that's my school We're I put part blood, of this family here that's right I put blood sweat and tears into this um, it's just like my, my, my crime uh, plan I'd like to come up with an amnesty program um, in that immediate community if there's a if there's somebody who's out there who's hustling if you will and they're selling drugs guess what you sign a contract with the local law enforcement the local state's attorney's office and the feds we take we, we confiscate all of your proceeds and that same block that you were selling those drugs in you're going to buy that corner store and you're going to make it uh, a, a green station where you're going to have alternative foods with fruits and vegetables and things like that those houses that were abandoned that you had people shooting up drugs in there you're going to fix it up and create affordable housing you can collect rent you can do all those things to legitimize that money and if we get one whiff that you're doing something wrong you forfeit it you go to jail and you're done all right and guess what they're going to help you police that community because they're <laughs> not going to want to go back to jail and they're not going to let that little guy get on that corner because he goes hey that's my block what better way to have somebody brag about that's my block and then not be my little hustlers that are out there but that's literally my block those that's monopoly that's right. I own and that store. I own those four houses. I'm collecting rent. I'm paying taxes. I'm contributing to the community that I devastated, and I've turned my life around. And I don't have to look over my shoulders. And I don't have to be in jail. I don't have to be in jail. See now, okay. We we I asked you before, <laughs> and we, now see this is why I had Russell on this show, and I've been chasing him down for quite a bit. So, why didn't you run for mayor? You know what? Here's the thing. Sometimes it's best to be the kingmaker instead of being the king. You can get so much done behind the scenes. You really can. I don't think Baltimore is ready for somebody like me. I'm too radical. I'm, 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 I think too <laughs> pragmatically. I think too, too just straight to the point. I don't believe in fluff. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what I think works. And that's not what people want. You can't get in bed with me and think that your, 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 your comforter is going to be different somehow because you got in bed with me. When you get in bed with me, you're getting in bed with the rest of the city of Baltimore because we're all in the same bed together. That's the problem. Um, this development, you know, we got a trash problem. Trash, you know, like they always say with when it comes to make somebody's trash is somebody else's treasure. Well, guess what, Baltimore? All of our trash is actually our treasure. And I say that because 
Why is it that we're not taking all of these plastics, these woods, these these plaster, uh, the the drywall recyclables, and making it into composite building material that is stronger, more durable than wood itself? You make these outside developers come in, 40% of the goods that you buy, which is our composite, that we build our own smelting factory to put it together, you got to buy it in order to build these buildings. <clears throat> we're putting people to work, we're, we're, we're taking care of our trash problem, and we're, and we're earning money because we're making them buy some of the, the uh, actual supplies that they need to use to build. It, it just it blows my <laughs> mind. It blows my mind. See, this is why I have him on this show. And, and now, I like a lot of the stuff that you say. And you and I have always, always talk about, and this, this, like I said, I call him all the time. He answers the phone. I come up with crazy questions, but, but the stuff that you talk about is good. It's inspirational, and it's a glimpse into a positive future. And granted, I'll give you this just this one time <laughs> that, yeah, I do think that you have a better goal than just being mayor because I think that what happens is what we need is ground roots building for our future. Yes, And absolutely. a lot, I mean, you've already covered stuff environmentally. You talked about the schools, you talked about the crime. So, you know what I'm, so if, if you win as mayor, you need to call this man. But on, an, on a more important note, I really think that anybody who's watching this and listens to a lot of the stuff that Russell Never Done has said, you really need to contact him. And especially when it comes to this school thing, sit and think about the possibilities of what he's talking about and what we can do. Think about what you said when it comes to to getting these repeat offenders who are drug dealers who have more money than I do. And I go to work every day. OK. And what we can do with the resources and the stuff that we have. Um, you know, I mean, it's, think it's, about it's, it. It's when, incredible. Think, I mean, think, I like it. Think about it. When the government locks them up, they forfeit their assets. They take them to get to hire more officers, to buy more technology and things of that nature to go lock up more. But wouldn't it be so much better if you could take them, turn it around, and get them to reinvest in the same community that they tore up. And you sign a contract. It's just like, it's like a confessed judgment. I'm already admitting, if you, you prove your case against me and you catch me, all, look, all I need is surveillance to show you're doing a hand-to-hand, -hand and I'm done. Huh. I'm done. And I walk away from everything. And you know what we do? We give the next guy in line. Now you get a shot. Now you get to walk away from... It's if you have choices. And the thing is, if people see that Ray Ray walked away and he's doing all this, they're going to do the same. Absolutely. Thing. It's, 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 it's the domino. Effect, As I tell everybody. my clients, there is so much legitimate money out here that it is sickening. You just got to be dedicated and you got to be committed to saying, I want better. If you want better, you have to do better. If you want different, you have to think and do different. Now, lastly, let's talk about Boys Rock. Yes. We talked about we talked about everything else and we talked about the food. And then just so you know, you thought I called and bugged the hell out of you before. I'm going to really <laughs> bother you now because we're going to be pushing some of the stuff you're talking about. And you got some really good ideas. And and as guardian angels and community service and activism, this is the kind of stuff I need. I've been trying to get him to put on a beret for years. But I mean, now he we got a school to build after that. Then, you know, he can come over and He'll take my me. job. And run get Baltimore. Me. We'll get him. You heard what he said. You heard that. <laughs> he, he said it again. He'll get me. There you go. All right. So. Let's talk about Boys Rock, which is another another one. So Boys Rock is uh, the inception came from uh, me just putting out so much work with uh, our youth going from partnering with uh, from Roland Patterson uh, Middle School to West Baltimore Middle School to uh, I've worked with the Green Street Academy. I've worked with a lot of different schools and, and worked with teachers, one at uh, helping teachers on educational law and how to protect themselves when they're dealing with some difficult situations, but more importantly, to also uh, provide mentorship. And I'm not talking about more so than mentorship, but modeling, letting these kids know that I come from the same environment that you do uh, in a lot of instances with having, you know, not having mom and dad there. Uh, mom struggled with uh, dealing with drugs, dad in and out of the prison system. Uh, with my grandparents, moved from one family member's house to another, but, but periods of stability, but still had that wrap around that a lot of these kids unfortunately are missing, still had that wrap around support. So I get it, but I also know that unless you have somebody that you feel like can relate to you, it's difficult. You know, that one of the worst things that kids walk around and I know that I, I dealt with for years was that missing parent syndrome. No child wants to feel like they don't belong, mm -hmm. that they're not wanted, that they're not loved. And so despite the fact of having phenomenal grandparents, incredible aunts and uncles, a host of neighbors that actually participated in that process, great teachers, there's always still that one piece in the back of the mind like, why didn't you love me? And that's a frustration and a piece that 
You never get over we, in time. It's a over. hole you can't fill. Absolutely. And so now when you're dealing with that, you wonder why these guys are gravitating towards gangs or why they're gravitating towards these little cliques or, or folk that are doing things because it's a sense of belonging mm -hmm. and somebody appreciating and finding value in me. So, you know, so I look at those things and, I, and I'm, I'm always saying, let me talk to these kids and just have that raw, unadulterated conversation with them to let them know you're not by yourself mm -hmm. and getting them to open up. But I also realize that in, in opening them up, I'm also opening it up to exposing them to options and opportunity. So uh, a good, a good, very dear friend of mine, uh, Pam Curtis, uh, who is and I don't know. Pam, I follow her stuff. Pam, Pam, is, is, Pam, I follow your stuff. I think you do amazing stuff. And before you know it, you're going to be sitting in a chair that Russell's in. We're going to be talking about it. Let me she, tell you something. She's pretty amazing. She is an amazing woman uh, raising two kids for the most part. I mean, not for the most part, but raising two young men on her own. And if you see her at a housing education seminar, her kids are with her. If you see her in a community involved information, they're right there. She is preparing these young men to actually do the kind of work that needs to and be done. And that's pushing the vision. Pushing her vision. She and, is amazing. And she, she really pushes is. the vision for everybody. And I told her, you got to stop and start pushing your own because she's got a lot that's there. But, but more importantly, she and I work together as well as Marcus Dent, the other Marcus Dent. The, Marcus <laughs> Dent, no relay. I know. Hey, Marcus, how you doing, buddy? Because I go into a room and they say, well, you're not that Marcus Dent. I said, no, no, right. not that Marcus. But we Ma have funny conversations right. about that also. But, but that, yeah, Marcus is but a good guy. Marcus, you got Arthur Squeaky Kirk. Uh, these are people who are just out there putting the work in uh, that are just grinding day in and day out that are putting that kind of work. So uh, having partnerships and relationships with them, I realized that I could just do something a little different in my mentorship with with the kids. And so Boys Rock was created because my thing was I want to build new leaders of the future. And what better way to do that? So with Boys Rock, which is building our youth successfully so that they will, will rebuild our communities, that's why I, I came up with that acronym, Boys Rock. And for me, it's really about getting into their minds, letting them know that they have options, reaffirming that you have value, you have purpose, and it, you, and it is a sin for you to waste your life, either to lose it through violence or to just walk away from being as great as we know that you are capable of being. Everybody has a purpose and we are interconnected. God has us intertwined like that. One person missing changes the trajectory of everybody mm -hmm. else's life. And, I, and I, I emphasize that to them. You have value. I don't care how down you feel like you are. Trust me, there's somebody who feels lower. I don't care how alone you feel you are. There's somebody who feels even more isolated. But the goal is, is recognize that all of us carry baggage around. The difference is, is getting to the point and learning the skills of how to recognize what's luggage that we can reuse and what's garbage that we got to throw right. away. Right. And so that's how I work with these kids and let them know you have value. You have importance. You have purpose. And we need to use that up because you serve in the greater good of this this whole function. You're going to come back to this community. And you're going to make a difference. I'm going to show you how to be a leader. I'm going to put you in contact with folk. I'm going to show you how to network. I'm going to expose you to as much as I possibly can from shadow me when I go to court. Come to my office and do a little internship right there. Let me introduce you to some of my friends who are who are physicians or who are doctors or who are that that contra uh, contractor, that uh, that teacher, whomever. I want them to know that we are real people. We're not the basketball players. We're not the football and, uh, NFL stars. We are very real people that are right here, that are tangible, that you can reach out to and say, "How do I do that?" And the, now, and I've seen it within the Guardian Angels. And one of the things you're talking about when you, you grab somebody, you take them into another whole kind of a world. And it's funny because it all starts, like you said, with the gang people. And you see, the saddest thing is to see a child or a teenager or in a corner whose parents can't tell them, you know, you're important to me and I love you. But when they leave their boys at that corner every night where they say, all right, man, I see you tomorrow. I love you, bro. Yeah. They get that. Yep. They get that. Absolutely. But it, it's a big deal. When you get these kids, and like you said, when they shadow you, or they meet the people, and then they go into meetings and, and buildings and, and go to places where they've never had the experience, and they feel important and empowered, not because you're dragging them along, because you're making them a part right. of what it is you have going on. And it's, it's such a big deal. A lot, you know, I've been lucky. I've been, I was raised by my sisters and grandmother and mother. You know, I had females that all basically taught me how to be a man, but I was lucky enough to have mentors come into my life who were police and FBI and, and adults who took, took me and said, hey, I'm going to show you how, how to play baseball. I'm going to show you, you know, what we do at our jobs. And, and these 
things you you can't you, you 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 can't live without them because I look back when I think about when you you know we talked about my my youth and my childhood and a lot of the stuff that I learned growing up I learned from my mentors who were professional adults who came up and said hey come here I want to show you something and they took the time to invest to teach me and things. I'm glad you said that you said when they said let me show you something because the new model the, or the new philosophy has to be we mentoring is not enough we also have to model that's right because children don't do what we tell them they do, they what, do they what they see they do what they see so and the mentorship is is guiding them giving that advice giving them that 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 lecture uh talking to them talking with them and, and helping and them listen. develop but the modeling is show walking the walk and not just talking to talk that's it's, it I do as i do as you see not as I say. Not as I say. And that's Do what they got to see. see. And you have, and because it's very important, it's very important out there that you have to be the example you want to be. Absolutely. And so it, it doesn't come in sometimes. Oh, I'm smoking a cigarette. I got to put this down. You know when he comes over. But at the same time, you got to be consistent at what it is you do because, and and you have you have children. Yeah. I have children, and. They literally, you can tell them one thing and you can act like, oh, they're not listening to me. They're listening. They're listening, they're watching, and they're repeating everything you say. So really, you should end up with a bunch of mini-me's because they take in everything we give them. It's like pouring stuff into a glass. It, whatever we comes out of us goes into them. And that's not just your kids. That's the community kids. That's the neighborhood kids. That's the kids that you work with. That's, that's everybody that you touch in life. And we have, they to, feed be, off and of we have to be invested in other people people's children besides you have it takes a village people it takes the village we and really, that's a real we really thing do. we really have to be invested in other people's children's lives you know we can't walk around on eggshells and here's the segue that I always tell people if you're doing it for the right reason then what you should be able to do because you should have that relationship with your neighbor I should be able to tell you and come to you and say, you know, even if your child came running home, say, you know, my Mr. Mr. Russell said and he did X, Y, and Z. And, and mom come out with an attitude. I'm saying, look, let me tell you something. I watch you raise this young man. I watch the sacrifice you make day in and day out. And I'm going to be your eyes and ears because I'm not going to let him go out here and embarrass all the hard work That's that you right. put into this child. I know what you're doing. I know how hard you work for him to go out and sack and, and, and have the clothes that he has and to get a good education and you busting your butt going in and out of work for you to have to be called off work to go, uh-uh, if I saw it, I addressed it, I didn't disrespect him, I didn't put my hands on him, but I let him know that's unacceptable and I called you myself to tell you this is what he was doing. That whole dynamic changes it's because now they realize, whoa, wait a minute, you out here embarrassing me? And it changes right. because of how you how you came off and you told it to them. But at the same time, we do have the parents out there where when something was you, you, you you've seen it in the neighborhoods where not my you know, baby. your kids go, well, who are you to tell my kid what to do? Y'all yeah. need. And not I've seen I've seen parents get defensive and go after this. And instead of taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, we're looking out for your kid because you weren't. And there's a lot of people that just don't. You know, you're agitated because they came home and it's still daylight outside. Why don't you go outside and play? Go find something to do with yourself. And now they're out finding something to do. But when somebody comes out and says, hey, they're doing something wrong, you need to know about this. Now it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it does take a village. We have to, I don't know how we get back to that. Well, but we, we got to start to it. looking in the mirror. And, you know, and I'm always the first to say that, you know what, at the end of the day, we have to be very real and transparent with ourselves before we can be real and transparent with anybody else. We really have to, you know. None of us walk around with, 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 with a, a glass slipper on our foot and, then, and think that nothing's gonna happen, that heel won't break. Our kids are capable of failing and falling short. And we have to be prepared and strong enough to, to love them, love them through the experience, love them through the mistake, correct them. And let them know it's and okay. And let them know it's okay to it's make okay. a mistake. It's okay. And plant that, and plant, and just, and, and pray that the seeds we plant in them will harvest at the time when it's needed. That when they're confronted with making that decision, whether I'm going to break the law or not, all those being in their ear and standing in their butt and, and over and over and over again, the things that you've said and tried to instill in them, when they get up to that line, that we pray that they're going to, that what you've said has stayed with them so strongly that they say, that's a line I just can't cross. I'm going to tell you, when we talk about, you know, those of us who are 50 and over, I think about some of the things that 
We weren't worried about venereal diseases. Mm -hmm. The utilization of prophylactics and protection was because it was a sin to have somebody <laughs> pregnant out of wedlock. Look, yeah. That was, you know, the, the, the heck, a whole the, the heck you, with that part. It was more of, this is an embarrassment to my family. You don't even hear about that anymore. You don't. You don't hear about it now because it's okay. It's an embarrassment to tell you not to get into that, that situation. Right. And remember before, it was like, you know, listen... Right. It was taboo. You just didn't taboo. do it. Taboo. You, it right. So, just so you weren't it. worried about that part. You were more worried about embarrassing the family name and having somebody pregnant with a child yep. out of wedlock. It's the that We got to get back to those core values and let these kids, let them be children, let them grow up, give them that opportunity because you only get to be a child once. That's right. And you That's get to right. be an adult for a long time. And, and, and it's going to be even longer if you have kids. Yep. You know, as a child. So, yeah, it's a big deal. But Russell never done. He's got a lot of good stuff going on. We're going to leave him alone because he's got the school going on because I was going to push the mayor issue, but I think <laughs> the school thing is more important. And he's, you know, with the Boys Rock, the foundation, all the great ideas. But, guys, if you watch this video, you know, my biggest thing about this whole interview is the school, and we've talked about it. And, you know, if, if I was... Uh, one of these famous rich people in Baltimore or somebody in a politician that could say, I can make that happen and this would make me look good, I'd make that school thing a reality. But I, I think, like I said, I, I'm always inspired by what it is you do. I'm still going to bug the hell out of you when it comes to questions well, and means. concerns. And, you know, I'm going to order the uh, beret and, and the red jacket and all that stuff. We're going to snatch him. You heard him say it here because I think if he says no, and I mean, we got it on tape, so I think we can, we can come after him in court for that. That's like a verbal contract. We got this. We got this. But I want to thank you for coming on here. I want no, to thank, thank you for, you for all having me. you do. I want to thank you for everything you do. And uh, this is Strider. This is Beyond the Streets. This is Russell Neverdon. And we will see you next time.